again to draw near to you, uh, to seek you out, to see you more clearly so that we can be changed by you, so that we can experience you more fully. Lord, as we open your word, open our hearts, lead us and guide us to your truth. May we stand ready to apply that truth tonight, to apply it to our lives, to be changed by it. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Hey, we're in Genesis again. Oh, by the way, um, Wednesday night we're going to the, the book of Psalms, and we're going to learn a lot about uh, different types of books as we open the book of Psalms. And one of the, the things that we see in the Psalms are what we call parallelisms. There's synthetic parallelisms, the antithetic parallelism, parallelism, synonymous parallelism. And it just so happens, as we consider that, we see a parallelism tonight as we open the book of Genesis. Um, the story that we're about to enter into is about Joseph. It's a, it's a, it's a man um, who is one of the 12 sons of Israel. His name is Joseph. And, and it, it's interesting that there's 25% of the book of, of Genesis is spent on Joseph. 25% of the book of Genesis. If you compare that to something, you know, just like in the, in the uh, chapter 1, we learn about the creation. And five words describe the creation of the universe. And we were talking about, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, the creation of the universe. We're, we're giving just simply five words. And you would think it would just be the, the opposite. If we're going to talk about a single man... There'd be a whole lot more emphasis to be placed upon the, the creation. I mean, we're talking about the universe. That's something that everyone's interested in, right? We want to know how this all came about. We look and we stand in awe. We stand in wonder. You know, how did all this come about? But that's not the heart of God. That's not what God wants us to be focused upon. He doesn't want us to necessarily be focused upon His creation. He wants us to acknowledge that He's the great creator. But there's something more awesome, something more closer to his heart that he wants to be focused upon, and that's his son. And that's the parallelism that we find in the book of Genesis. There's a parallelism between Joseph and Jesus. In Joseph, we discover many things about Jesus. There's many prophecies that's given to us about Jesus in Joseph's life. There's, there's things we, we can understand about Jesus, his character, his nature, as we absorb Joseph. And so as we open the book of Genesis chapter 37 tonight, that's the anticipation I hope that we all have, how we can see Jesus in this. I mean, G Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament. We see him in everything. We talked about just recently on Sunday morning how even the tabernacle, the temple, was a picture of Jesus. You walk into the tabernacle, and immediately to your right, you find the table of showbread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Over to your left, you'd find the golden lampstand that lit up that dark place, that, 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 that temple. He says, I am the light of the world. And then immediately in front of you, you find the altar of incense, speaking of how he's our great high priest, interceding on our behalf, because that's what the altar of incense is about. It's about the priest going in and interceding on behalf of the nation. And then there's, there's this ginormous veil <laughs> that was a picture of his flesh, we're told. And then beyond the veil, you'd find the Ark of the Covenant. And what was contained in the Ark of the Covenant? The law. Jesus kept that law perfect. I mean, th those are just some examples. But we find this one man, Joseph, who becomes even a more clear picture of Jesus. So I'm excited. As we travel through this, tonight especially, we're going to see this, this awesome picture of Jesus that is found in Joseph. Um, one other thing I want you guys to understand is that uh, we'll, we'll take note of it when we come to it, but Chapter 37 is not necessarily in chronological order from the rest of the stories that we've been looking at. Chapter 37, we're kind of going to slip back. If it was fit into chronologically, it would probably fit best at chapter 33, chapter 34, when we're looking at a chronological timeline. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at Jacob specifically. We're going to... Um, yeah, Jacob... No, no... Um, Judah, Judah. We're going to be looking specifically at Judah, and then we're going to get back on the story of Joseph. And then we'll kind of be in that chronological timeline. But we're kind of we're kind of digressing at this point. But anyway, with that said, we can we're picking up tonight, chapter thirty-seven. It says now Jacob lived in the land 
where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his, his wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to his father. So what's the very first thing we learn about Joseph? Dad, the boys have been bad. <laughs> <laughs> he brought back <laughs> he brought back a bad report he's a snotty little 17 year old boy and he's ratting out his older brothers his grown men these men that were grown full grown men so he's bringing back a bad report now it kind of sounds that way like he's this big old tattletale but the thing that we see in Joseph, when we study him, and, it, and we see his true nature, true character, as we compare him to Jesus, we're going to see that that's not Joseph at all. Joseph just simply loved his father. Joseph wanted, you know, he, he was close to the heart of his father. He was in harmony with his father. Whatever his father wanted, that's what he wanted. That was Joseph. It wasn't that he was a tattletale, that he was a rat. He just loved his father, much like Jesus. We read in Luke chapter 2, verse 49. Oh, if I can get there. Chapter 2, verse 49. It says, well, this is when uh, Joseph and Mary were looking for him. They thought, you know, they'd lost him. And they, they find him in the temple. And he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? He said, did you not know that I would be in my father's house? I said, you, don't you know how much I love my father? That, that that's where I would be. That's where you could find me. And he also write in John chapter 5, verse 19. He says, uh, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself unless he sees, he sees it's something he sees his Father doing. And, and, and so he said, unless I see my Father doing I'm not going to be doing it because I, I want to be in harmony with my father. In John chapter 8, verse 29, he says, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That was Joseph. It's not that he, he was a rat. It's that he, he knew his father's heart. And so he brought back, he was just being open and honest. His, his father wanted him to know what his brothers were doing, and he was just giving this report. He wasn't going to lie to his father. He was just in harmony with his father. He wanted to please his father. It wasn't that he was against his brothers. He was all for his father. That was simply it. It's so now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic, a coat of many colors. How many of you heard that story, right? If that's all you know about Joseph, then you really don't know anything at all because it really wasn't a very colored tunic. It was not a coat of many colors. If you dig into the deep, deep into the Hebrew word, it, it is a coat with big sleeves. A coat with big sleeves. A, a, and and the, the, the deal with the, 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 in those days, there was always a head of the household. There was always a leader of the family. There was one with authority. And, and, and a coat with big sleeves was kind of like a briefcase today. Those with authority would have the big sleeves. Those who were laborers, those who were working, would either have no sleeves or the sleeves would be rolled up because they would be working. And so, but the one with the big sleeves is the one who had the title deed to the land. He was the one who had the important documents that he would be carrying around. Like I said, it would be kind of like a briefcase. And so what, what Joseph did in this case is made this 17-year-old boy, he placed this 17-year-old boy in charge of his adult brothers. And this, this, of course, angered his brothers. Why is this kid being put in charge of us? And so they resented their father for that and hated him. His brothers saw that the father loved him more than all of his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak on friendly terms. And they just like, this is just appalling to us. How dare he, you know, try to be telling us what to do. They, they, they didn't like him. They, he was hated by his brothers. And so too Jesus. As we can look at these parallelisms, as we look at Jesus, we can also see how he was hated by his brothers. John tells us he came to his own, 
but his own rejected him. His own hated him. And why did his own hate him? Because of his relationship with the Heavenly Father. He came as a truth bearer. He came speaking truth. But those of his own didn't want to hear that truth. They would not receive that truth. They hated him for that truth. So Joseph, verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 5, then Joseph had a dream. And when he had told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. <laughs> he said to them, please listen to this dream. He says, please, he's begging them, please listen to this dream. I want you guys to hear this dream. Can I hear his heart here? Because all, you, know, you can look at this story and say, man, he's just throw it in their face. They hated him, and now he's coming and telling them this dream. What was he, like kind of rub it in their face? Listen to what he says. Please listen to this dream which I've had. For behold... We were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sleeves gathered around and bowed down to mine. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? So he said, please. And I, I, I picture in my mind's eye that Joseph was you know, disturbed by this. He didn't understand it. He, say, he sees in this dream these sheaves bowing down. He realizes these are his brothers. Why would my brothers be down, bowing down to me like this? So he's kind of disturbed by it. But they think that he's throwing it in their face. He's, he, and they said, are you really going to rule over us? And of course, this is what the brothers of Jesus said. You remember that? Well, we're going to get into it next week. He said, we will not have this man ruling over us. They rejected him. And that's what's happening with Joseph. They, they, we will not have this man. This is appalling. We're not going to have this snotty little brat ruling over us, was kind of their attitude. Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and his, and his word. So they, they despised him even more. They, I mean, the, the more he talked, the more he, he revealed to them, the more they hated him, the more they despised him. And so too. I mean, the world hated Jesus. Jesus said, the world's hated me. It's going to hate you. Because we're truth bearers. We, we simply reveal truth to others. People don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear what makes them feel good. They don't want to hear how their lives are in opposition to God. And so when we reveal truth, we're hated. And so too, Joseph hated his brothers simply because he revealed this truth to them. Verse 9, it says, Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have still, I've had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow ourselves to, before you to the ground? So Joseph, I'm sorry, Israel clearly understood what Joseph was saying in this case. He says, Shall I... And your mother and your brothers bow down. So he's identified that the 12 stars represents the sons of Israel and the sun and the moon represents mom and dad. This is important because this is where we, we develop Bible typology. And this is something we see later on in the book of Revelation. But be that as it may, he's identified. But there's also a dual um, prophecy or um, what word am I looking for? There's a dual symbolism, should I say. Because not only does the, the stars represent the, the sons of Israel, but the stars also represent in this case, and as we shall see later, because we're going to understand why Joseph's having all these dreams and what it's pointing to, later on we're going to see that the stars represent the rulers of the world. And we're also going to see how the sheaves represent the provision of the world. So he's actually going to be in charge of all the world and all the provision of the known world, of course, Egypt being the world in this case. So, and of course, this also goes deeper to when Jesus returns, how he will eventually rule over all kings, all rulers of the world, and how he will also, everything, all provision is going to fall under his authority. So it's a, again, we see a picture, a parallelism to Jesus in all this. All this, this story is simply a prophecy, if you will, of Jesus and what, what Jesus will come to do. Where did I leave off? 11. His brothers were jealous, but his father kept the saying in mind. So again, now you have to wonder, why does he keep telling them these stories? Why does he keep telling them these dreams? 
And it is simply because he came to reveal truth. He, can't, he wanted them to know the truth. And I think some, at some level he's, he's still confused about it. He's, he's, he's concerned about it. So his, his father rebukes him, but he keeps these things in mind. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock at Shechem. At Shechem. So this tells us where they're at and it, geographically. You may remember they crossed the, the Jordan River and they settled uh, facing Shechem. So I believe this is taking us back to that time frame. Well, you remember Shechem is the, the wicked place the, where the men were so wicked they raped Dinah. They were just vile, wicked, mean people, and they raped the, uh, the, the Israel's daughter Dinah. That, that's this, this is the same place. It's, it's, it's a place of wickedness, perversion. And so they're going out to pasture the flock in this area. Verse 13, Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Again, we're, we're looking at how this relates to Jesus. God is looking down on this wretched, this fallen, this wicked world. And he says, I want to send my son. And what did the son say? I will go. So he's, he's obedient to the Father. He, he's, God says, I'm going to send you into the world. The son goes into the world. Then he said to them, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the, from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. So he's sending the son to Shechem. Reminds me of the story we find in uh, Matthew. Um, Matthew chapter 22, I believe. The, 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 there's a vineyard owner and uh, the, the vineyard owner kept sending these messengers uh, into the vineyard to get, you know, to get a report back from them. And so he sent one messenger after another. And Jesus related the story and how it represents how God sent one prophet after another to, to seek the welfare of his vineyard. And finally he says, well, they won't have any respect for my prophets because they keep beating them. They keep rejecting them. Well, I'll send my son. And what happened when he sent the son? The vineyard owner, they killed the son. And so this is a picture how God has sent messenger after messenger of Israel, and he, finally he sends his son. And this is going to be the end result here in Joseph's story as well. They're going to kill the son, or attempt to anyway, or plan to, should I say. Verse 15, And a man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, What are you looking for? And he said to him, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pastoring their flock. And so the father sent the son, and the son seeking to, you know, those that are lost. He's, his brother's lost. He's seeking out his brothers. And that's what Jesus came to. He came seeking those who had been lost. He he's came to save those who had lost. Verse 17. The man said, They have moved from here, and I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph after his brothers and f went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. Dotham is, a, is on the way to Egypt. It was like a major trade route. So they're, they're, they're facing toward Egypt. They're, they've come to Dotham. And so there's many people that would be passing by at this point on this major trade route. When they, when, uh, when they saw him from a distance and before he came to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. And again, this, this speaks of the, the nation of Israel and their attitude toward Jesus. Specifically, the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests. They seen Jesus. They seen what he was about. And what did they start doing? Because they were threatened by him, because they hated him, they began to plot his death. Verse uh, 19, they, they said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. Of course, this actually did put the dream to a test. If, if they killed him, you know, they were planning to kill him, they said, well, let's see what happens to the dreams. But again, this is all happening according to God's plan. He will not be killed because God has given a prophecy through these dreams, and this prophecy will unfold. 
So this does put the dream to a test. 21. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of, out of their hands and said to him, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit, this pit. This is, the, this is in the wilderness. That is in the wilderness, I'm sorry. But do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to, to his father. So Reuben is plotting to, to, to rescue Jacob, Joseph, I'm sorry. But he, doesn't, he, he just doesn't take a stand. You know, he try, he's trying to cater to them. Joseph, you know, when he revealed his dreams... He just kind of let the chips fall where they're made. He, wasn't, he did not have a fear of man. He didn't fear his brothers. He, he, he was more concerned about his father, what his father thought of him. And so when, when, when he revealed these dreams, it was more about, well, I just got to reveal all that God has, has given me here. Any, my point, at any given moment, you're either going to be in fear of God or in fear of man. Every decision that you make, is going to fall into one of these two categories. What, and what I'm doing because I fear man, because I'm more concerned about what man thinks of me, or is it about what God thinks of me? The proverb tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom, but the fear of man is a snare. See, J, uh, Reuben has found himself in a snare here. He knows what's going on here is dead wrong. And it's deadly wrong. <laughs> but he, he fears his brothers. So he's, he has this desire to rescue Joseph from this, but he doesn't put an end to what's happening. Here's, he's the oldest brother here, and he, and he has the power to say, no, we're not going to do this, but he doesn't. And any, any one of these men, any one of these men can say, no, if you kill him, I'm going to be telling Dad what's happened here. But none of them wants to stop what's happening because they fear what the others are thinking of him. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him. Of course, this is exactly what they did with Jesus, isn't it? Jesus wore a tunic. He was a man of authority. Rabbis, just like any businessman in that day, had a coat with big sleeves. And in the sleeves, they would keep a Torah. They would keep, you know, they would keep Scripture. They, they, this is where they would store it. And Jesus, you know, he, he was a... He actually had what was called a seamless garment. It was, I mean, it was just, it was one, um, how do you say it? It was wo woven as one piece. There was no seams in it. And it was a very expensive garment. But that was also a garment that many priests would wear, many rabbis would wear in that day. But they stripped him of it. They stripped him of, of his authority. That's, in effect, what they were doing. That's what they're doing with Joseph. They're stripping him of his authority. And they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Again, again this is all a picture of Jesus. When they stripped him of authority, when they crucified him, what did they do with his body? They threw it into a tomb. They threw it in a tomb that had never been used. It was an empty tomb. Then they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, Behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites. You guys remember who the Ishmaelites are? They're the cousins of, uh, of, of the tribes of Israel. This, this is uh, Jacob's brother's family. No, it goes even back further. Isaac's brother's family, uh, Ishmael. So the Ishmaelite, Ishmaelites are actually cousins of them, but they're, they're again, they're, they're pictures of the flesh. They're a picture of a Gentile, of the Gentiles. I'll get deeper in that in just a moment. So they sat down and eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Galid with their camels bearing aromatic gum, a balm, and myrrh, and on their way to bring them down to Egypt. So they're going to Egypt to trade. They're on this major trade route. They're headed down to Egypt to do some trading. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Now, all of a sudden, he's got a different idea. We shouldn't be killing our brother. So now he's got a conscience, right? <laughs> Not really. He's just seen the opportunity to make some money. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. 
Now, again, this is all about painting a picture of Israel. I'm sorry, Jesus. The nation of Israel the, the, is painting, and the story of Joseph is painting us a picture of Jesus. What did Israel do? What did the leaders of Israel do? You, we talked about it this morning, right? They handed him over to the Gentiles, the Romans, because it was prophetically speaking. And that's what we see happening here. They're handing him over to the Gentiles, to the Ishmaelites, because it's painting this picture. The reason that Israel had to hand Jesus over is because they had taken away the authority to uh, carry out capital punishment. Judah's speaking up, hey, we can't do this. This is our brother, you know. We shouldn't be doing this. So they're handing him over to the Ishmaelites. And they're selling him out, basically. Verse 28. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled up, pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. What did Judas Iscariot do? He sold Jesus out for 20 or 30 shekels of silver. Uh, silver being a picture of redemption. But he, there's, again, this is all prophetically speaking of pointing us to Jesus. That's what the entire Old Testament was supposed to be about. In this, we see Jesus, how he's our Savior, how he's our Redeemer. And this is all painting a picture of him. You know, Jesus said, you search the Scripture because you think in them you have eternal life. But in these that are testifying of me. He's saying, you think it's about this religion. It's, you think it's about how you can get to heaven, but it's not. It's, you think it's telling you what you must do, when in reality, it's telling you what you cannot do. All these scriptures are pointing you to me. This is one of the pictures that, that it should have been drawing the, the eyes of Israel onto their Savior, because he's a picture of Jesus, you see. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. I, I can't help but think of Pontius Pilate. You know, we kind of touched up on this again this morning. Pontius Pilate, you know, uh, uh, there's two legends that's propagated. There's one, you know, the Coptic Christians in Egypt will say that uh, after the, the crucifixion of Jesus, Pontius Pilate, eventually, because he was impacted by what had happened, that he re eventually repented and become a Christian. Another legend that, uh, that's also propagated is that, no, he didn't become a Christian. In fact, he went the complete opposite direction, and that, and that, and that he, was, uh, he just went insane because he, you know, he, he realized what had happened. It drove him crazy, and he committed the suicide. Two legends, but either way, he was, he was impacted by what happened. Just as we see Reuben, he's greatly impacted. He had left. He'd come back. He found the tomb empty. And he, 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 he's just torn up by it. And he, he, he mourns it. Verse 30. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they, so they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. Lies and deception. Where do they learn to deceive in this way? Their, 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 their intent is to deceive their father. Where do they learn this, this deception? And I can't help but think how, how uh, Jacob had took a goat's skin, a goat's hair, and deceived his, brother, his father with that. Now his, his sons are doing the very same thing. They're taking goat's blood, and their intent is to deceive their father. The Word of God says, whatever a man sows, this too he shall reap. And that's what Joseph, or Jacob, I keep saying Joseph, Jacob is doing. He's reaping what he sowed. He sowed into deception, and he's reaping of deception. The apple doesn't fall from the tree, far from the tree. His own sons are deceiving him in the exact same way he deceived his father. Verse 32. And they sent the very, curled, very colored tunic, and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. So they've taken, they've taken this blood-soaked tunic and said, Dad, is this Joseph? Oh, we found this. He must have been eaten by a wild beast. Is this Joseph's? Then he examined it 
it is my son's tunic. So he realized that that is indeed his tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So that he, he looks at it and says, oh, no, this is, Joseph is gone. He's, he's mourning now. Verse 34, so Jacob, Jacob <laughs> tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his, on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And of course, he believes that Joseph is dead. He believes that he, he's no longer going to see him. He's gone to the grave. Then all of his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol or to hell or to the afterlife in mourning for my son. So he wept for him. So again, we see it would appear that Jesus was buried, that he was done, that he was dealt with, that he was never going to be seen again. But what happened? There was a resurrection. And so too, we're going to see this resurrection. As far as Joseph is, or Jacob is concerned, he's gone. He's never going to be seen again. But there's going to be a resurrection. And out of this resurrection will also come salvation. He's going to save his brothers. He's going to save all of Egypt. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar's, Potiphar, or Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. So, what we've examined here tonight, and as we continue on, we're going to see even more pictures, and I've lost my space here. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, as we study this, this story of Joseph, we're just, we've just seen, we just begin to touch the, the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more pictures and images and things that, that's going to be revealed as we look at Joseph's story. This, this, it's just picture after picture after picture of Jesus. So as we look at these 17 chapters, under 17 chapters that we're going to be looking at here, they, they all become Joseph's life is simply a story of Jesus. And it, it's, to, it's just to reveal Jesus to us. Paul writes, and that's the verse I was trying to find there, and I can't find I didn't put a, a sticky in there. Paul writes, in the, I think it's 2 Corinthians, that, that our lives is simply a life, we're a living letter. What are we a living letter of? What, what's the story that we're telling? Well, the story that we're supposed to be telling is the story of Jesus. When people see us, they're to see his reflection in our lives. And that's the question I want to leave with you tonight. Are you like Joseph? Does your, does your life give the world a picture? Are you a reflection of who Jesus is, of his nature, of his character? Or are you more like Esau? And the one that we've seen in the previous chapter, Esau, or not Esau, yeah, Esau, who was a picture of the flesh. We looked at this, at the, at this story and how the, the flesh is deceitful, how the flesh is, is, is strong in, in, in of itself, and, but how the flesh is crisp, uh, tricky, crafty, conniving, deceiving. What is your life like? Are you a picture of Esau or are you a picture of Joseph? Are you a, uh, does your life reflect Life in the flesh or life in the spirit? You see, we're a living letter, Paul says. We should be giving this world a picture of Jesus. That's what Jesus says. I am a light unto the world. But he goes on to say, you are a light unto the world because we're to be reflecting him, you see. Anyway, that's the story of Joseph, and we're going to continue on. Uh, again, it's just a beautiful picture of, of, of uh, a parallel, as we talked about. As we're going to be studying in Wednesday nights, a parallel uh, of, of the life of Jesus. So I'm going to leave there. Next week we're going to be looking at Judah, and then the following week we'll get back into the Joseph story. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for loving us. Uh, we love because simply because you loved us. And Lord, as we study this life of Joseph, I hope that we all seek to be like Joseph, that we, uh, we become a, a, a picture uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ to this lost world. And may uh, there be more in this world saved as a result. As we see salvation come to uh, Joseph's brothers, not only Joseph's brothers, but the entire nation of Egypt, we pray that we can, too, uh, be a light of salvation to this lost world. Uh, Lord, may we bless you this week as you have blessed us so abundantly. May we seek to be pleasing to you in everything that we do. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray.